When we're in need of a good scare, sometimes fiction is the best answer. A creepy movie or a spine-tingling novel might be just the thing to satisfy our urge for a fright. However, sometimes the truth is, as they say, stranger than fiction. For a chilling thrill that has the added boost of being 100% real, today we'll be looking at five strange true crime cases. By all accounts, Christina and Andre Rayrak were considered likable, described by their neighbors as being nice and hardworking. In February of 2021, the couple was in their late 50s and living in Georgetown, Ontario, Canada. Georgetown is considered to be a safe and beautiful city, close to Toronto, giving residents the luxury of big city amenities with a quaint small town feel. Since the area has such a tranquil reputation, it came as a shock when emergency services were called to the Rayrack's idyllic cul-de-sac early on the morning of February 17, 2021. By the time the authorities arrived at the home on Hidden Lake Trail around 5.30 a.m., flames were leaping out of the home. After extinguishing the blaze, fire crews entered the rubble and found two bodies, presumed to be Christina and Andre. From the start, the entire situation seemed strange, and the Ontario Fire Marshal initiated an investigation. The bodies were found in the garage where the fire was started. The flames went on to consume the entirety of the two-car garage, the Rayrax vehicles, and a portion of the home. By February 19th, two days after the incident, the Fire Marshal's office handed the case off to the police. Though details on the case remain largely unavailable to the public, the Rayrax autopsies made it clear this was no accident, and a neighbor's chilling surveillance footage confirmed it. Around 6.30 p.m. on February 16th, Andre's car is spotted pulling into his garage. As he places the car in park and begins to gather his things before exiting the vehicle, a shadowy figure approaches the garage and enters on the passenger side of the car. Andre doesn't appear to see the dark figure, and he proceeds normally, getting out of his car, walking towards the internal entrance to his home, and pressing the garage door button. The last thing we see as the garage door gradually closes is the hooded figure slightly dipping his head to remain hidden behind the car as Andre enters his house. No one knows the timeline and how exactly events unfolded for the Rayrax after that haunting footage or how long the killer lurked in the home before he struck. However, just under 12 hours later, the Rayrax were dead and their home was on fire. Canadian police have remained tight-lipped about the finer details of the investigation, but just over a month later, in March of 2021, a suspect was apprehended. Authorities say 27-year-old Harrison Brown is the culprit. Originally hailing from Mississauga, a town close to Georgetown, he knew Andre before the murder from business dealings. Again, the nature of their relationship is unknown, and Brown's motive remains unclear. All we do know is that Andre was a manager at the Boiler Inspection and Insurance Company of Canada. In August of the same year, Brown was charged with two counts of first-degree homicide and one count of arson. As of September 2021, his case was pending trial, and the status is unknown at this time. Petite, fastidious dog lover Debbie Wolf of Fayetteville, North Carolina, was not the type to miss work or even be late. Having just graduated nursing school two years prior, Debbie was still fresh at her job, though according to the Fayetteville Times, she was known by her co-workers to be a dedicated nurse, lovely young woman, and all-around happy person. During the holiday season of 1985, Debbie spent Christmas Day with her family before returning to work on December 26. Last seen alive when she left her shift around 4 p.m., Debbie never showed up for her scheduled shift the following day. 
a fact that deeply troubled her mother, Jenny Edwards. Disturbed by her daughter's uncharacteristic absence, Jenny, her husband John, and the family friend, Kevin Gordon, headed out to where Debbie lived with her two dogs, Mason and Morgan, on a rural patch of land outside of Fayetteville. Upon reaching Debbie's cabin, her family found things in disarray. Her normally neat dwelling was cluttered, with clothes and personal belongings tossed in strange places. An odd message on Debbie's answering machine implied that she hadn't been at work for several days, which was false. Debbie had only missed one day at the time, and the male voice on the other end of the line stated that he was concerned and hoped that she wouldn't miss any more. Hey Deb, missed you here at work today. You've been out a lot of days. You make me worry when you miss another one. Just want to make sure you're okay. Empty beer cans, a brand that Debbie didn't drink, were scattered about the property. And most troubling of all, Mason and Morgan hadn't been fed. Jenny, understandably distraught, contacted the police, who refused to get involved until Debbie had been missing for 72 hours. On December 31st, five days after Debbie's disappearance, the police finally arrived at her property with bloodhounds in tow. With the police unable to find any trace of her, Jenny grew frustrated and set her sights on the one area of her daughter's home that hadn't been fully explored, a shallow, murky pond on the property. Family friend Kevin Gordon returned to the site with another friend, Gordon Childress, ready to search the pond. On New Year's Day, 1986, the two men found Debbie's lifeless body mere moments after beginning their dive. Gordon noted that there were two sets of footprints on the bottom of the pond, as well as drag marks scarring the mud. Debbie's body appeared to have been shoved headfirst into a 55-gallon barrel that she was known to keep on her property. The police were quickly notified, and the following day, the pond was drained and Debbie's body was retrieved. Curiously, though, there was no barrel. Official autopsies concluded that Debbie had drowned and that she had likely fallen into the water while outside playing with her dogs and tragically perished. However, the evidence is not so clear-cut. To begin with, Debbie's body and clothes were relatively clean. If she had been submerged in dirty water for several days, why was there no silt or debris found on her body or within the clothes? Regarding her clothing, her family insists that what she was wearing was not hers. Debbie was discovered wearing clothes and shoes that were not her proper size. They were much too big. For example, the jacket she was discovered wearing was a men's size small and the shoes were a men's size six, roughly three sizes larger than what Debbie wore. Her car was also discovered on the property, parked strangely with the seat pulled all the way back. Debbie was 5'3", she wouldn't have been able to drive the car with the seat in that position. Then there's the matter of the beer cans, a brand she wasn't known to consume and the suspicious voicemail. Finally, the barrel. Authorities insist that there never was one and that Kevin and Gordon simply mistook her jacket floating around her body for a barrel. However, the barrel on Debbie's property was never recovered and Kevin and Gordon insist they were not mistaken. Although the official ruling is that Debbie died by drowning, her friends and family have never accepted that verdict. She was known to be a strong swimmer, and the autopsy only showed a minimal amount of water in her lungs. Years have passed, and no suspect has ever emerged, although one hypothesis exists. At the hospital, Debbie was in charge of coordinating the volunteers, and two male volunteers had become fixated on her in the days prior to her death. According to her mother, both were interested in her romantically, and both had been rebuffed. One of them, with a history of psychiatric illness, frightened Debbie by finding her home phone number and calling her repeatedly, saying he knew where she lived and threatening to come and find her. The other had just been turned down by Debbie, telling him she just wanted to remain friends. Both men were questioned by the police, but no substantial evidence of their involvement was ever found. 
Frustratingly, no further traction has been made on this bizarre case, and authorities seem determined to keep it closed. Born in 1985, Bethany Ann Lydline's talent and intelligence stood out at an early age. She grew up in a conservative and religious household, and she carried that deep Christian faith with her into her adult life. At Southwestern University in Georgetown, Texas, where Bethany was on scholarship, she encountered the charismatic Tyler Deaton, a fellow devout Christian. The pair quickly connected, bonding over their shared faith. Tyler's natural magnetism pulled other students into his orbit, and he soon found himself leading his newfound friends in intense prayer sessions that frequently involved healing the sick or, quote, warding off evil spirits. While his friends began looking to Deaton as a leader and prophet, he privately struggled with his sexuality, believing, as many hardline Christians do, that he could change his homosexuality and heal himself. By 2007, Tyler had decided that he wanted to go to Kansas City to join the International House of Prayer, a church in the area. Bethany and over 20 other students from Southwestern University dutifully packed up and followed Tyler to Missouri. Tyler, Bethany, and his followers settled into life in Kansas City, living in two houses separated by gender and calling themselves the community. Bethany finished her education, becoming a nurse, all while living a strictly religious life within the community. Tyler was the de facto leader, and he became increasingly controlling, dictating members' eating habits, dating relationships, and clothing choices. In 2010, Tyler, continuing to deny his sexuality, struck up a romantic relationship with Bethany, and by August of 2012, the pair were married. Bethany's family, though allowed to attend the wedding, felt uneasy about the situation she was in. Bethany's mother, Carol, felt sad and left out, remarking, We weren't even participants, we were observers. While her longtime friend, Taryn O'Brien, felt like Bethany was no longer herself. When Taryn left after the wedding, she had a haunting feeling that it was the last time she would see her friend alive. The marriage was troubled from the start. Despite a two-week honeymoon in Costa Rica, the pair never consummated their marriage, with Tyler finding himself unable to move past his homosexual feelings. When the pair returned to the United States, Tyler continued to seek out sexual relationships with other men, including a member of the community, Micah Moore. Even though it's unknown if Bethany knew about her husband's extramarital affairs, his lack of intimacy with her was taking a toll. And only six weeks into the young marriage, Tyler noted that she seemed suicidal. Her family was kept in the dark when it came to Bethany's unraveling mental health, unaware that she had suicidal feelings and oblivious to the fact that she was admitted to a psychiatric ward after threatening to drink windshield washer fluid. On October 29, 2012, Bethany appeared intensely distraught after one of Tyler's sermons, and the next day she was found dead in the back of a van. A loose plastic bag around her head, an empty bottle of sleeping pills by her body, and a suicide note that read, My name is Bethany Deaton. I chose this evil thing. I did it because I wouldn't be a real person, and what is the point of living if it is too late for that? I wish I had chosen differently a long time ago. I knew it all and refused to listen. Maybe Jesus will still save me. Though her death was initially ruled a suicide, Bethany's family was suspicious. They were right to be. Roughly 10 days later on November 9th, Bethany's longtime friend and her husband's sexual partner Micah Moore appeared at the Jackson County Sheriff's Office and confessed to killing Bethany. He claimed that acting under Tyler's orders, he had drugged Bethany and then suffocated her. Though some of the details of his confession fit, something still seemed off to investigators, and they began to probe further into life at the community. Moore further admitted that ever since Bethany had moved into the men's house after her marriage to Tyler, 
the male members of the community had been drugging and assaulting her. This appeared to supply a motive, as Tyler had become afraid that Bethany would report the abuse. Though he later recanted, Moore was indicted later in November of 2012 on first-degree murder charges. In January of 2013, he pled not guilty and was released on a $250,000 bail. The community quietly dissolved, with the International House of Prayer severing all ties with Tyler and his followers. Shockingly, in October of 2014, the charges against Micah Moore were dropped with prosecutors citing a lack of evidence. Additional evidence has surfaced that points to Bethany committing suicide, including the FBI matching the handwriting on the note to her handwriting. However, the cause of her death remains undetermined rather than being listed as suicide. As for Tyler, former members of the community paint him as a manipulative, cult-like leader. Even if he didn't have Bethany murdered, his treatment of her and the treatment that he allowed and encouraged among his followers certainly contributed to her dwindling mental health. He moved back to Texas and became a pre-calculus teacher at Lancaster High School just outside of Dallas. When his potential involvement in his wife's death came to light, he was suspended from his job. Since 2013, Tyler has spoken openly with the media, participating in a lengthy interview for the CBS show 48 Hours. The case is still open, and investigators are not satisfied with the answers that they currently have. Although nothing directly can be tied to Tyler Deaton at this time, when it comes to indirect evidence, Colonel Ben Kenney of the Jackson County Sheriff's Office simply says, I would rather save that for another time. It was a balmy summer's day on June 30th, 1999, when Ricky McCormick's badly decomposed remains were discovered by a passerby. Authorities arrived in the middle of a cornfield in West Alton, Missouri, a rural community right on the Missouri-Illinois state borderline. Ricky, a 41-year-old high school dropout, hadn't had the easiest life by the time his body was discovered, lying face down in the Missouri mud. Though he was never officially diagnosed with anything, family members believe that Ricky struggled with some form of mental disability or illness, leaving him barely literate, but still able to function in society. The middle-aged man held down various low-level minimum wage jobs until a relationship with an underage girl landed him in jail for 11 months. Upon his release, Ricky began working for a man named Baha Hamdallah, as a gas station attendant. However, Hamdallah had some less than legal hobbies and frequently roped Ricky into his crimes, forcing him to go down to Orlando, Florida and traffic huge amounts of marijuana back to Missouri. Apparently, this did not always go smoothly and both Ricky's aunt and his girlfriend noted that he seemed especially rattled after his last trip before his death, though they never found out why. Ricky was last seen alive on June 27, 1999, three days before his body was discovered. A co-worker of his remembered Ricky coming by the gas station for a moment in the morning, but no one knows where he went after he left. When his body was discovered three days later, it was horribly degraded, more so than it should have been, despite the summer warmth. Authorities surmise that he had been killed elsewhere and kept in a hot building or vehicle before being dumped in the lonely cornfield, contributing to his advanced state of decomposition. Additionally, Ricky was 20 miles from his home and had no method of transportation to his name that could account for such a distance. Inside of his pockets, police found two curious slips of paper with roughly 30 lines of unintelligible scrawled text. This further added to the mystery surrounding the case. Although no cause of death was able to be established by the medical examiner, police decided that he was the victim of a homicide based on the strange circumstances of his death alone. 
Notorious drug dealer Gregory Lamar Knox was suspected at first, since he was already presumed to have committed four other murders in Ricky's neighborhood. Secondly, his boss at the gas station, Baha Hamdallah, was also a suspect, thanks to his relationship with Ricky and his hair-trigger temper. Hamdallah was known to fly into a rage and shoot people, so it didn't seem too far-fetched that he would have killed Ricky in a fit of anger. Unfortunately, no evidence was found to tie either Knox or Hamdala to the slaying. The mysterious notes in Ricky's pocket continue to baffle investigators as high up as the FBI's Crypt Analysis and Racketeering Records Unit, but the strange code has yet to be cracked. Some think that the killer planted the strange puzzle as a way to thwart investigators, while others believe Ricky was passing coded notes between criminals. Another theory that his family largely supports argues that Ricky's semi-literate state would cause him to scribble things often, not knowing what he was writing. A fourth logical explanation is that the notes were a personal shorthand developed by Ricky, but his family doubts his mental capacity to develop such a system. As Ricky's aunt, Gloria McCormick told the Riverfront Times in 2012, Ricky went to see a psychiatrist and he said Ricky had a brick wall in his mind. Over 20 years later, the police still have no idea what happened to Ricky McCormick and are no closer to apprehending his killer. The FBI has released the notes to the public in hopes that someone might crack the strange code. In early August of 2014, New Zealand native Warina Wright took an ill-fated trip to Gold Coast in Queensland, Australia for a wedding. Warina was an animal lover and a deeply caring soul, with one friend describing her as being all about dignity, equality, fairness, and what's right. After matching with Gold Coast resident Gable Tosti on the popular dating app Tinder, Warina agreed to meet up with him. The duo ended up at Tosti's Place, a unit on the 14th floor of an apartment complex in the Surfer's Paradise neighborhood. CCTV captured the pair entering the building around 8.45 p.m. on August 7, 2014. Five and a half hours later, in the early morning hours of August 8, 26-year-old Warina Wright would plummet to her death from Tosti's 14th floor balcony. At some point during the night, the two got into a heated argument, with three hours worth of audio captured on Tosti's phone. No one knows exactly why he chose to press record that fateful night, but at 12.55 a.m., his phone begins to capture audio. You are like, yeah, I'm trying to off my balcony, you goddamn psycho little Just a horribly, horribly unfortunate choice of words without having any idea what, you know, would happen next. Tosti can be heard swearing at Warina and saying she was lucky he hadn't chucked her off his balcony. The full context of their altercation is difficult to grasp, and all that's really left is the audio and Tosti's allegations. He claims that as Warina drank more throughout the evening, she became increasingly erratic and combative, leading him to lock her out on his balcony for his safety. Though it is impossible to know for sure, it's claimed that Tosti was frightening and threatening Warina, even choking her at one point. Prosecutors argued that there were sounds in the audio file from Tosti's phone consistent with choking. It was hypothesized that once locked out of his unit, Warina had no choice but to try and flee from his clutches, and she fell to her death merely trying to escape. What is certainly strange is Tosti's behavior immediately following the incident. Three minutes after Warina's fatal fall, at 2.23 a.m., CCTV captures him emerging from his apartment building and proceeding into the Surfer's Paradise neighborhood. Soon after, he makes a call to his father and updates him on the situation. His father urges him to stay in the area until he can get to him. So Tosti wanders around eating pizza until his father collects him around 3.10 a.m. It's unclear where the pair went afterwards. 
Tosti pled not guilty, and a jury eventually agreed on October 20, 2016, refusing to convict him of either murder or manslaughter. Jurors ultimately felt there wasn't enough evidence, and the involvement of alcohol, as well as a homeowner's right to remove people from their dwelling, played into their verdict. Although Tosti might not have been legally guilty for Warina's demise, his behavior after the fact is morally gray at best and certainly paints the night with a cloud of suspicion. Additionally, in September of 2021, Tosti, now living under the name Eric Thomas, surfaced in the news again. This time, it was his relationship with high school drama coach Sabrina Collins in the spotlight. She alleged that during their courtship, Tosti sent her abusive texts and voice messages which prompted her to abandon their relationship and report him to the police. When the police did nothing to remedy the situation, Collins went public, denouncing him on social media. Tosti claims that it is the other way around and that Collins is stalking and harassing him. How odd that he finds himself in another he said, she said type of situation. We'd love to know what you thought about these disturbing true crime stories. Do you have any theories or do you have a true crime puzzle that keeps you up at night? Let us know in the comments below. And of course, thanks for watching.